four-year-old scripts a lot throughout the day about movies, songs, etc. Constantly wants to sing songs too. Sometimes he uses some of the scripting appropriately with his sentence sentences, but most of the times no. When he is constantly singing, I can t I tell him you can sing in the bathtub or the car. He sometimes stops. The scripting can be a little harder sometimes. I ask him what are you talking about, and he'll say things like the show, the movie, mm -hmm. pictures, etc. How can I redirect him or make it more appropriately because he, uh, he is trying to communicate more that way? And they wrote, thanks a lot, guys. And I believe that this is a dad who wrote in. Mm, this is awesome. These are very good questions. And mom or dad, I love it when parents are so in tune to what's going on with their kids. Very nice. Mm -hmm. um, nice description, nice care, concern, everything. Um, so a couple of things. I started noticing this type of thing like, I don't know, you know, 25 years ago with our kids and came up with a lot of ideas to help uh, with out of context, um, sort of repetitive uh, delayed echolalia is sort of how we look at it. But it is very, um, it is, you see an intention in it. That you, you definitely see our kids wanting to, like using what they hear on TV or hear in music um, to, to try to connect somehow. So it's, there is a, there's a social aspect to it for sure. Um, but it is an inappropriate uh, way of trying to socialize or to interact. So you do kind of want to keep it under control um, and redirect it. But at the same time, it's not something that you would really want to eliminate. And I'll tell you why. Because if you think, if you look at how, how old was this child? Four. Four, yeah. So if you look at other four-year-olds, typically developing four-year-olds, they're, a lot of their conversation is, um, uh, telling you about things they've experienced a lot of their so you know a three-year-old or two-year-old might just be telling you by pointing to things and labeling things and all they're doing is they're, they're sharing their experience with you so what they're you know like fire truck or whatever it is they see and that's the that's uh, that's a very important thing actually it's one of the symptoms of autism not to do that so it's very very important to share your experience with someone else because that's the very beginning of uh, theory of mind development and then you have you know at four and so on they'll come and tell you things like um, you know or three even you know Johnny ran away or Johnny pushed me over whatever it is they're, they're sharing something with you when you weren't there right, right. so what our kids try to do when they start to uh, take scenes from, a, a, let's say, a movie or, or a TV show and tell it to you or say it, repeat it, the, the real, it's not odd that they're doing that. That part is fine because a lot of kids will come and say, uh, you know, on such and such show, blah, 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 blah. It, the weird part or the odd part is that you, they don't introduce it. They don't say, all they really need to do is say, I saw, do you remember that show we saw? I mean, this is half my conversation with my kids right now at this age. You know, it's like, do you remember when we were watching Breaking Bad, blah, 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 blah. Right. Okay, so it's that one introductory statement that's it's really the missing. That it's have. the context, exactly. So what you should rather do is teach the contextual introduction. That's okay. what you should be focusing on. So sometimes it won't be appropriate because the setting guides what is appropriate. So let's say if you're in school, in a classroom, it's not going to be appropriate to talk about anything because you're listening to the teacher. If you're if you're in the middle of conversation about something, it's not appropriate to suddenly break out in, in singing. Although, depending on the age, <laughs> it might be. I know but, adults that do this. I know Charlie would do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but the, con the context has to be present. So you're, you would start by 
I would start by listing all the circumstances under which your child does either one of these things. And there's, you know, singing and then there's talking or re repeating some, a script from a movie or something. And then I would, for the, I, for the script ones, I would really um, introduce a, com like a, have an introductory statement. And you should start with one and you can then vary them. It'll be things like, uh, you know, um, do you, I, I saw a show and blah, 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 this is what happened. Or, uh, you know, uh, this show called blah, 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 there were these kids doing this, or whatever it is. I would format the introduction. And it sounds like your kid is um, high-functioning enough to have that level of yeah. language and so on. You can also prompt it. You can also write down the sentence and teach the child by just, uh, if your child is able to recognize words, which a lot of our kids like this are yeah. <laughs> so um, and then when it's song or music then I would just say uh, some introduce it with something like you know that song that goes blah 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 or so find appropriate contextual things that you can add to the beginning of this and then at the same time you know uh, teach your child how to transition away from it okay so and the way you that you tra do that is you literally will start with a very obvious cue like as soon as he starts telling you about it you'll say hold on you'll set a timer right or an egg timer is even better because then they can see the thing yeah. and during the process of the egg timer like maybe make it a minute timer or less then he can talk about that but when it's over then he needs to have a transition out way and it's a very like you want to make sure it's a very clear visual like a stopwatch stop and start and stop time and then gradually you'll hide the visual you reduce the visual you'll maybe give him other ways to track how long he's doing that you uh, did fingers that he could say fingers. three things about there a video go. game and when and, and i, I was doing the I fingers and then he was doing the fingers i totally uh, remember this and then i do remember that yeah <laughs> And then the other thing is that uh, later on you can also uh, tack the sort of the the ending activity or the ending like when the time runs out, uh, you will then teach your child a transitional off statement. So like okay, let's and then or or an attention statement thing like this I is now time this. to attend to body language. Now right. I've said the three things. What's my reaction? Like that's the kind of thing you want to do. You need to take. Where, did, where do I go now? I've said the three things. What's my next move? Now, see, that's the piece I haven't done. That's the okay. piece where I need to get to. Isn't right. that so, interesting that we're all like at different places different on places, this continuum? Yeah. But, um, so for Jim's level, you really would just point out, now look for a reaction in the person. Yeah. Because that's what will guide you to the next thing that's appropriate yeah. to do. Yeah. I think a lot of what our kids are missing is just that ability to uh, quickly modify their behavior based on the reaction. Yeah. In fact, yeah. that's a good lesson. I should write that. Some sort of alternation of, of responses and having our child become very fl fluent on different types of uh, things. I Can I use pen? pen <laughs> no, that's okay. I give her a pen and a pad. I just get so and, many ideas yes, here, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, great. And so a great place for you to start in terms of teaching this. But my question now, I cycle back to when it's happening in the moment yeah. while he's teaching it, how does this dad react in the moment most effectively? I mean, I think I think that you immediately have to start with some form of timer. Uh, that's the okay. very first thing you do is that you do limit the time frame immediately because otherwise it'll be happening and perhaps not only the time frame but the number of times in the day so you'll have a chart I mean I don't know how frequently it's happening first you get a baseline obviously okay. let's say let's assume it's happening ten times a day and each time it goes on endlessly unless you stop it so you will say that your baseline is 10 you want to focus on reducing you know stopping it when the buzzer goes right as soon as he starts you turn on a timer okay. make sure he realizes they're going parallel to each other okay when you buzz you tell him okay it's time to stop and that's when you redirect him to something else really fast okay and get him busy with something else right and, and then by do the way, we reward when he's busy with something else and not doing it or do yes. you reward the transition you reward all of it you okay. just, this is non-contingent reward at this point because okay. when you have good control on the child like when you have when you're directly intervening like it, 
involved in intervention with a child, mm. you're supposed to, I mean, the best type of therapy, obviously, is not to ever wait for the child to make a mistake, right? right. You're, the idea is always to be one step ahead of the child in terms of prompting him so right. he's always correct and then he's reinforcing. So you're constantly reinforcing. Okay. So it actually appears like it's not even contingent on anything because it's a, a ongoing uh, yeah. reinforcer. I'm working on French with my son right now, a lot of French, like, uh, you know, infusing him in it. And honestly, like, he'll make two or three mistakes and then he'll have a correct. And I'm constantly just, even on the mistakes, I'm like, that was really good trying, though. You yeah. got it almost right. That was perfect. Like, it, the experience has to be very, very positive awesome. anyway. But so the first thing, I think, is to set that timer and get him used to the timer. And then it's to reduce the amount of time in the timer. And then it's to reduce the number of sessions during the day. And every time you do this, someone has to be there because you have to redirect to some other activity and by the way an activity that would be incompatible is probably best so for instance um, I don't know if he, he's good at talking about other things like if you can ask him things that he's actually accurate on like what's your name where do you live what's your phone number how old are you whatever it is other labels and and so because talking is going to be incompatible with saying that stuff right right other things might be incompatible as well like a lot of our kids don't do uh, the the repetitive uh, out of context stuff if they're busy with like let's say drawing or right. painting or something they really like or even blowing bubbles would or be blowing bubbles is right? a great because one because you have to blow you can't be scripting. absolutely absolutely okay. so great ideas there wonderful I'm going to move on to this next question that came in on the Facebook uh, they wrote in and said hey Shannon and Dr Doreen Grampiche uh, they gave their name I'm going to leave that out uh, she's from Mississippi she mm -hmm. has Asperger's syndrome I'm trying to find resources for adults on the autism spectrum who want to live independently but there's hardly any resources here in Mississippi for adults on the spectrum I went to vocational rehabilitation but it didn't help me gain employment I have difficulty with housekeeping and taking care of myself mm -hmm. my parents oh. are afraid to let me live on my own without them but I'm 20 years old and need to try to not depend on them for everything I don't know what I would do without them also I was in a huge car wreck a while back and it almost killed me and my mom. Now my mom and dad are afraid to let me to tr uh, try driving ever again. They don't even want to talk about the thought of me driving again. What should I do to convince my parents to let me be independent? What resources can you recommend? I love this person. Oh my God, I love Isn't you. You're lovely? the best. And how yes. articulate is she? This is lovely. You're a beautiful writer. <sighs> Once in a while we'll get an email like that from one of our one of the very, very high functioning individuals out there uh, just asking for help and that those are the ones that just uh, touch me the most. Yes. Um, I We have developed a, about, I want to say somewhere close to 200 uh, videos for teaching adults uh, adaptive, vocational, uh, say, you know, a variety of tasks, um, everything from, I think, preparing food to jobs, you know, various activities that are involved in jobs. And we're in the process right now of putting those videos on a website so that the public can consume them um, because it seems to be rather urgent for you. I would suggest that you, um, have they sent in their email information? I, I am friends with this particular person okay, on Facebook because Wonderful. We, we started a friendship, so I, I know how to reach so the this So the person, family. great. So the person, uh, Shannon here, you know, is Sarah Cho's project, yes. but Katie Gibbony, uh, you know Katie? I, I have met Katie once, once yes. Yeah. So Katie is, uh, is basically developing all of those programs and videos, and she's very also, both Sarah and Katie are very, very passionate yes. about helping our adults. Yes. So uh, this is part of our adult program now so if you could reach out to Katie and uh, we'd be happy to uh, maybe she could have a conversation with this individual and send okay. them copies of whatever videos are interesting to them um, for free and just uh, let, let her get started on something that might be useful okay great and but then, you're, you're in Mississippi Mississippi 
There's not a whole lot in Mississippi, unfortunately, but, you know, maybe we can assist just getting you through some of these things. Well, and here is here's my question for you. Um, are you in a school where you're getting credits where you can do an internship? Um, because I could if that's the case, I can only take an intern who is somebody who is in a college doing credits, but I could use an intern to do social networking. And you clearly are somebody who uh, has skills that would lend itself. Well that's that. wonderful. So that's wonderful. We could, you and I could certainly talk about that as well, if that's something you're interested in, but you have to be getting college credit in right. order to be able to be eligible for that. So and, and don't don't get too sad about the driving thing. I would let it go for a little while. I think your parents might be open, more open to it once you've developed some other skills as well and some time has passed. And there's a lot more you can do to practice driving even prior to actually getting back out there. And even, I will say this, a lot of people don't drive. A lot of people you don't, don't drive. You don't need to drive to get around in the world. Probably in Mississippi, a lot of people do drive, though. I mean, if you lived in New York, nobody drives. Right. <laughs> so you and in L.A., most people drive. But I know yeah. people in L.A. without a car who take the buses and go everywhere sure, in sure, L.A. Sure. I, I know people who, uh, I know a screenwriter that I could list five films that he has made that you would be like, oh, I, like, I know who that is and he doesn't drive yeah he said yeah. i you know when i was like 21 i realized i don't want to do this this is that's not amazing what, so he just doesn't drive period a period and Good he friend. made up his mind that that was not going to be something he wanted to do so it's not one of those things that you have to necessarily do right but for the moment you know so let maybe let as you said let it go for the moment maybe it will happen later on but if it doesn't life can go on without uh, absolutely that. somebody mm -hmm. said i need a bcba yesterday this is an expression that i use all the time Mm. Uh, the school is not working with the concepts of autism. Uh, if I don't have the information, what am I going to do? Uh, that's a single mom and she says I have the cutting edge of therapies I have skills uh, now I, she said they have paid for nine months of it and that they haven't actually been able to get to it this is sh her saying I've not been able to get to it due to using Linda Mood Bell first um, to show that she can learn um, but now mom is saying that she does need a clinical BCBA and that there's none in her area what can she do she's given us a phone number um, Do we know what state it is? I'm looking to see. <coughs> Uh, I don't see a state. So if you're still watching, I know you wrote this in a little bit earlier this morning. If you're still watching, write us in right now and tell us what state you're in. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I just wanted to know because it, I, I, this is I the... I look up the area code. <clears throat> right. These are what, it's sometimes when I see parents who are uh, trying to do a lot of different things, those are the cases where I really want to see the child because I'll tell you what to do in the right order. Sometimes we get really overwhelmed and try to just take on too much and then we do things in the wrong order and then we're wasting time we're wasting the child's time or we're not taking advantage of the child's um, age and abilities um, <clears throat> Linda Mood Bell programs are appropriate for some kids not all um, skills is not something that would conflict with Linda Mood Bell so you can definitely you should start with skills anyway it's an assessment that's the biggest portion I think the biggest thing you need is to have a very detailed assessment of your child so you can determine what the areas of need the most significant areas of need are so don't just worry about things that you've seen do the skills index it will give you a very clear picture Arkansas oh okay Oh, Arkansas is one of those places where we really want to do something, actually, because if I'm not wrong, Arkansas does have a mandate and actually has You're coverage. Right. Now, um, and we're talking the Little Rock area, according yeah, to the area code, right? If that's correct, right? So I would, uh, so what, in order to give you assistance, I mean, first of all, I think you should definitely do the skills index because it will really give you a good idea of what your child's areas of need are the most significant areas of need and then and really i know you you are aware of a lot of the areas yourself just subjectively but skills will organize it for you and will point out things you never even thought of um, then that will help determine what different things you should be doing. In terms of a BCBA, you just have to go on our website, contact our remote services department, um, and our website is Center for Autism. 
the, um, unrelated disorders or cards or whatever you look it it's up, Center for Autism Autism. Com. and you will see uh, a section, a tab called Remote Services, and if you go in there and send in information, then your information will be picked up, and we somebody will contact you, and they will have a, send you a bunch of paperwork for your child so that we can get some basic history and information, and then we will give you a supervisor. And if you can, uh, the, the cost for the family is transportation to and from, so you would be flying the supervisor in and putting them up in a hotel, but they will come to you, assess everything, set up uh, all the programs, train people in your local area, like could be high school students or post high school people, and then oversee the program, keep coming back every few months, see you through FaceTime, and um, be able to stay in contact and move your child's program forward continuously. Uh, we've done these programs for years and years now. I have kids who've recovered through this modality. So I don't, you know, it's, it's a very doable thing. Um, if you have insurance in Arkansas, if you have insurance that covers you, your child, we will access the insurance, no problem, because what we will, what we do is we hire the therapists in your area and they work for us. The director of this remote services program is John Galley. I've given out his name a few times. He must love me for that. But I would... <laughs> I would um, really suggest that you get in touch with our remote services department. They're very, very helpful. Okay. I, um, she goes on to write more. All that was great information and useful to her, but I think we're going to want to talk about some more stuff because they're specifically having a problem at school. Okay. Um, she says uh, that her pediatrician, and she's trying to figure out what to do with the school situation. Her t pediatrician typically expects her to form a letter. Uh, so fine, but it needs punch and allows protection for my pediatrician and for, uh, for my child and for me. They were directed to this site, but we, at the time when she got here, we were talking about another topic. She says, school does not really know what to do and is only getting worse, and they are only protecting themselves, not telling me what I need to know in a way that matters. And she says that they're wanting her to put her daughter on a bus at 5.30 in the morning uh, to return home at 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night to do homework. Um, she says, sending to LR, which I don't know what that is, um... And she says, where or how will she bond? Um, okay, and, and there's some, there's a couple of things here that I'm not completely understand. She says, have they offered this yet? No. Others fish for answers. So I think this is just sort of the runaround that she's getting at school. She said, I say a clinical BCBA who understands the global concerns, but can they do what is necessary on the school scene when she is there as much as she has to be legally? They have created chaos. They have given reinforcers that are causing more harm than helping. They seem to have the avoidance behaviors too. I have to get to work. Not really sure how I can meet my needs. Um, if, if, if the person cannot be globally assessed, uh, assessed either, what can I do to get it all on the table? Um, so, you know, I feel for you because you're in that moment where you feel like the school doesn't know what's happening. You want to get something happening at school. They're wanting her to be at school from 530 in the morning till 630 yes, between ridiculous. bus rides. Right, that would not fly in an IEP. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't even know the child, uh, child's age. But again, what I sense from your email is there's a massive amount of chaos around you right now, and you are uh, having a hard time dealing with all of it. And <clears throat> I would too, if I were you, because there are so many issues and they're not organized. I would really start by organizing what is most important, which is why I kind of said do the skills index. Now, let's step back even further from that and say there are certain things that are legal matters that are dealing you're dealing with right now. There are certain things that have to do with, uh, you know, your child's, I guess, comfort and uh, just being able adaptive uh, environment and then there's some stuff that have to do with just content that you want to teach your child so you know the, no child should have to be on the bus for that uh, that early and that late no child should have to be on school grounds that many hours period and Kelby has clarified that LR stands for Little, Little Rock, Little Rock. We're talking, so they're having to bus her into Little Rock right. to get her into classes that's right. part of the issue right so and you know the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act has a section called free and appropriate education which basically means if they're not providing your child with what's appropriate 
at no cost to you, then they need to pay someone to do it. I don't care where that is. In California, a lot of families get funding for these types of things under FAPE, Free and Appropriate Education Act, but uh, it applies to every state. I would find a special education attorney. That's the first thing I would do, is I would find a special education lawyer. You know, you have a fantastic, uh, a group of physicians who deal with autism in Arkansas. Obviously, Dr. Richard Fry, Dr. Jill James, these guys are in Arkansas and they're the top of the top in medicine for autism. And I would start by contacting them as well because they might have some connections to behavioral agencies or um, some resources for you. They might know some good lawyers in the area and so on. There are two centers, I believe one is in Little, Little Rock. But separate the issues, maybe perhaps get some help from some family members right now because you're going to need to deal with uh, legal stuff. A lot of parents here in Shannon will say this as well. We're also, we're very, very anxious to get things going for our kids, but until you fix the legal stuff around it, it just continues to be a mess. So you need to have a lawyer who will represent you at an IEP where you can get things sorted out first. So you will then have perhaps, you know, maybe, maybe the answer for your child, depending on where you live, is homeschooling, where someone needs to be paying for a therapist to teach your child the things they need. Maybe, uh, you know, they have other arrangements. Maybe they have to actually produce transportation for your child that will not result in that long of a period of time. I don't really know why she's in school that long. Maybe they ha so the state has to provide you with aftercare. I don't know a lot of these things. Maybe you're working and that's why she's there. I, I really don't know. But a, a special education lawyer will be very helpful to organize all of that. And then when you, when you start wanting to worry about what to teach, then you go to skills and that will guide you. Okay. So just to, to recap some of the things, you know, one of the first things you got to take care of is the legal mess in this. Yes, it you do. Sound, it sound, uh, we, you know, we don't know based on everything that's, that's happening, but, you know, we hear the concern about how much time she's spending away, and I'm concerned about how much time on a bus. Nobody would, that's not good for anybody. No. Um, so taking care of your legal issues, reaching out to the autism community there, making sure that you get some good resources and support, because that's you've right. written several times that you're a single mom, and that... And that you're working, and right? So that, that sounds that's very tough. Full plate, right there. Very so tough. you need to get some help and support, and that skills can, can be helping you. I, I will say this: what I, you know, we've heard really great reports about Linda Mood Bell, and and that that's a wonderful thing. But I happen to know it's one of the more expensive things you can do, and it's also one program. In other yeah. words, it only really deals with one facet or one series of, of deficits and issues. Uh, your child will need a lot more than what Linda Mood Bell is yeah. providing. It's a very it's like working on handwriting, for instance. Yeah. It's one thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hear you, though, when you say that you did Linda Mood Bell because you wanted to be able to show her and yourself and everybody else that she had the ability. So I definitely hear that. But I think that skills and taking that assessment is going to help you um, and getting in contact with your autism community so that you can get the support that you need and get a great BCBA working on your case and helping you to drive what's happening at school. Um, and also, and yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Shannon. I, I mean, I think you should also perhaps try to see if there is a local feat, you know, families for early autism, autism treatment. treatment. Um, because you, it sounds like you really need some personal support. Yeah. You know, this is everybody not, does. Everybody does, and if you have a child on the spectrum and you're alone, you really do. And so, please get some support for yourself as one of the primary things as well. Absolutely. Hi, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. My four-year-old son has tons of words and talks in four to five word sentences. Many times, he uses up to eight words in his sentences to request, or when he's trying to tell us something. He is an autism. AB, he is in an autism ABA-based school, 25 hours a week, and it's one-on-one -on -one all the time, which I know is good for him. And he's getting 10 hours of ABA at home plus OT and speech. 
Now my question is, when should I start seeing him starting to make conversation on his own since he has so many words and uses them all day, every day? He can answer so many questions, but barely ever initiates them or any conversation. He's such a bright little boy. He can read more than 10 words and write them too. He's a letter lover. Ha ha ha. He knows his ABCs back and front and even makes them with his hands. So I'm just wondering <laughs> when he'll bless us with him making conversation with us. Thank you guys for all that you do. God bless all of you. Dr. Nadowski, Dr. Tarbox, Dr. Doreen, and of course you, Shannon, hugs to you. And you said, uh, you, uh, hugs, uh, you hugs make my week just more. Bless. So you, uh, um, you have a child who has the potential to actually have a typically, you know, normal life and uh, come out of the spectrum. There's, without knowing him personally from all the things that you wrote, my children who are like this always make it. But it is very, very important that you do the right things at the right time. Um, and I don't know who your program is. I don't know what your school is, and I don't know what your program provider is, who your program provider is, your ABA program. So, uh, you know, and I, and I don't know how long you've been in ABA, but um, I would be very relaxed about this if, if I knew that my staff was working with you because the program we have guides you to definitely start going to initiation of conversation. Um, you have now, you, you, since you have uh, a school and an ABA program at home, I really, really want you to go on skills. I really want you to use skills. I want your BCBA or whoever's in charge of your program to use skills to guide them. Please do that. Please do that. Because most people out there, most schools and programs and BCBAs don't know how to teach these types of very subtle things. They don't, they haven't spent a lot of time developing curriculum. They'll start teaching rote things, which is fine because that's level one programming. But once you go to like more advanced levels, which your child needs, then it's a lot of cognitive behavioral stuff going on. And you really have to have the child think through things. You have to have the child initiate conversations, for instance, and to be able to identify cues in the environment that help him know when to initiate conversations. And these are lessons we have in skills. So if you have a good uh, program leader, a supervisor, a BCBA, um, and they uh, you first go into skills and you ask answer the several thousand questions that are in there about your child and that'll produce a very, very good profile of your child, a developmental profile that'll tell you every area that he or she is, is delayed in um, and or is beyond their age as well, excessive and, and uh, deficient. And then it'll kind of guide you in terms of how, the things that the child still needs to learn. It'll tell you what they are and how to teach them. So uh, your supervisor can use that information. And so for instance, they'll look and say, okay, your child's able to uh, say eight word sentences in some cases, uh, manding, um, how do I get him to spontaneous conversation? And the program will guide them completely, step by step. It's a lot more than you think. There's a lot of things there. But it, your child sounds like they have all the tools necessary to get there. So it really is just about the, the appropriate guidance. And, and really all I can tell you right now that would be helpful is to become a member on skills. It'll guide you through the whole process. It'll guide your supervisor through the whole process. Okay. And make sure your school and your home program communicates with each other and that they're they're one and they're consistent so your child doesn't get mixed messages okay wonderful We're gonna we take... have been uh had talked about last week a sound sensitive 13 year old um they sent in a couple of follow-ups uh he, that he's startled by every day on and off sounds when the air conditioner turns on or off when the temperature changes or the toaster oven or the water boiler uh but he isn't aware of the appliance being turned on um if if he isn't aware of it being turned on he's fine sometimes we attend some Sometimes we don't even see it. He's nervous if we see. 
And then she went on to write. So I'm sorry, Sean. He he's turning them on and off. No, I didn't understand. No, that. but if they if they go over and he sees them turn on the toaster oven, that's when he's having a reaction to it. But if he doesn't see, and then it's it's it sounds like to me the reaction is more about them than the thing because if they do it and he doesn't see it, and then, then the sound is bothering him. And right. and when they, when he sees their reaction, that that's the thing that bothers. She goes on to say that they did the FBA on skills. Uh, when it happens because of anxiety that you had given them some advice and that they're going to uh, work on. But their question is, when it happens as escape slash control, non-compliance, or wanting to hear no, he covers his ears and can pair with verbal sounds to block out sound. And how should she intervene when that happens? She says, what do we do then? Okay, all of those things are different functions. Okay. So you just go back to the VIP builder, do C5. I don't know if you've done the indirect functional assessment. I, she says I, that they did the FBA on skills, okay, which I believe CIFA. is the that CIFA. Is CIFA. So that should take you to the BIP builder because each of those, when, when someone does something in order to escape, you don't let them escape. When someone does something in order to gain attention, you don't give them attention. When they do something in order to gain access to a tangible, you don't give them access. So essentially, what they are trying to gain by the inappropriate behavior, you take away. And, and then you give it to them, you give them what they're trying to gain for appropriate behavior. So because you listed a whole bunch of different functions, they all have different things you should do. So again, I think the BIP builder kind of lists all of those things. And I will tell you, if you have the time, and I realize that not everybody has the time, but one of the things I did when I first started to play with the BIP builder was I took a behavior that my son was doing you plug it in, and, yeah. and I plugged it in with all of the different functions right. to see what each of the different things said. And I learned so much from that Yes. yes. because it was so specific to my child and I was able to compare and go, oh, well, it I opened my eyes and I, and I don't even remember what the behavior was, but I remember looking at it at one point, it, it was saying, you know, that you would want to do this and not do yeah. that. And I went, oh, that's the exact opposite of what, of what I've been I doing. Do. Yeah. And, um, but being able to look and compare to put it in for all the functions, it takes a couple of minutes to mm -hmm. be able to do that. But it was really eye opening yes. for me. Yes. If you've got the time to do it, it's kind of fascinating. And then of course, for each function, you get about 20 suggestions. Right. So and don't to... reject any of them, except all all of them right. and go through and look at them and say which one is more feasible for you to carry out. But it was also interesting because sometimes my problem was that the thing that I was thinking I needed to do, I couldn't do in the location that, 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 that was happening. So I was able to weed those things out and see things that I hadn't thought That's of. That's a great idea. Which was really kind of cool. It was very good. Uh, it was it was kind of a fascinating. Oh yeah, I mean, you know when you go to a makeup place and they say if your skin tone is this color and you turn a wheel and it says these this color lipstick and this kind and you go really I had no idea it was kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, it's very very useful. I mean it, it's really going to help you if you slow down and just use the features of it. Yeah. Um, it does sound very clearly that he's not reacting to sound but he's reacting to what he sees. Yeah. So, you know, it, it has something to do with you. Well, the good thing about that, oh, like, yeah. you know, I always think, I mean, sometimes things happen that are driving us crazy, but there's a little kernel of it that's like a really strong skill. Oh, yeah. The good thing about that is that the joint attention has got to be really strong if that's Absolutely. what he's noticing, which is going to be good later on for social skills. Definitely. And also, you always want it to be something external anyway. Like, if he's reacting to you, that means he is either seeking your attention, trying to upset you, or whatever it is. That is much better better than dealing with sound sensitivity. Right. I mean, let me tell you. Because you can harness this. Yeah, exactly. Sound sensitivity is a hard one, you know, yeah. to deal with. So this is a lot easier to deal with, but it has to do with, it, it, generally, this is typical behavior of our kids just trying to get a reaction. But, you know, do the VIP builder and go through every single one. They have different functions. Different functions will have different ways to intervene.
uh, somebody who's wanting to know how can I have some help setting up play dates? Right, play dates for are four-year-old. I know it's kind of hard. I uh, do they say boy or girl or boy? Generally speaking, I uh, there's several different aspects to play dates that you should think about. One is well, first of all, you know you're going to be looking at neighbors or uh, family members. That would be your number one thing. Would be family members. I would tend to go for family members first. Uh, and you are looking for, believe it or not, a slightly older girl as the ideal play date. So if your son is four, you're looking for, let's say, a six, seven year old girl. Um, and if you can find that person, because the six and seven year old girls are more like teachers and they really like having a little person to take around and teach. Uh, if you, you know, I always have names for everything. You guys talk about things and it's all very nice. And I always have a name in the back of my brain and I call this the bossy gut girl. Oh, totally. Because that's what we all need. And I was a bossy gut girl. The, the girl who just orders everybody around and, yeah. and every single classroom has at least one bossy oh, gut yeah. girl. Oh yeah, those are the best kids though for, because they're yes. like, they're intrinsically they're therapists. That's yes. what they are. <laughs> and they get a sense of satisfaction from teaching your child or whatever they want so yes. you will you'll try to find somebody like that um, I mean you know if you're, your child's very young so I doubt they're already in school maybe they're in preschool um, <clears throat> talk to the teachers they often have guidance on this uh, if you don't have access to, to that then I would start by looking at you know cousins neighbors etc you know it's funny one of our uh, John Galley again, whose name comes up all the time, one of our director of remote services, had the idea of actually providing a service that would do this, that would allow, would access, would give you access to other kids so that you could do, you know, kids, parents could put their kids up for play dates and you yeah. could rotate. But it is a very hard concept, it's a very difficult thing. And um, I think. Um, Another, maybe one approach is to go take your child to outside activity like gym um, or, you know, places where there are group activities going on where you get to meet other parents and uh, give them, give other parents a chance to get to know your child before you request play dates. That's a tough one. It's and hard, uh, yeah, and those are the day things. Day thing, and you it do really the best is. You can. And you know, I wouldn't worry about it too. I mean, your child's pretty young, like four year old. It's not so late. Like you should really be working right now, focusing most of the time on uh, teaching core skills uh, r before you do a lot of play dates. Like at four, you're really still pretty much teaching a lot of language, teaching social skills one on one, um, and then you take those skills that have been mastered and practice them with play dates. Okay, we had a couple of people respond to some of the things we've been saying earlier. The person that you said, I don't know who your services are with, yes. um, that was doing well, she said, hi, unfortunately we're not with CARD. Um, she said, I'll try skills. I once tried skills a few weeks ago and was really overwhelmed by yes. it and had no idea what I was doing, but he's been doing ABA for almost a year now and they're in New Jersey. I just want to say to you, I'm going to do a show soon about how I use skills, but if you ever need some help, it's one of my favorite things to do is to show skills to another parent and, and really pair through all the stuff. The thing about skills that I always say is it's like saying to somebody, here's the internet. I know, it's and really unless hard. You, and, and like in the beginning, you don't know how you want to use it. And then you find a way that you like to use it. And then a friend says, oh, I use it to this. And you go, really? You can do that too? Like we all were with yeah. our smartphones. You don't have to use all of the features on skills. Let's, you and I have a conversation about That's what very you nice, want it so to be shine, able to yeah. do. And I'll show you how to do that. And then get to know that. And then you can branch out into other things. That's a very, it's very so nice great. offer. I really appreciate appreciate that for this family that that's wonderful absolutely I'm happy to do that for and, and also you have an ABA provider get your ABA provider on skills because some of the lingo is very technical I apologize I know you know what I I often regret having done this I um, Sangam you know managing here makes, makes fun of me and says you spent like 16 years complicating this thing and now you're trying to uncomplicate it you know which is true I just kept trying to make it more and more complete, right? Yes. And so it became kind of a crazy document. I don't like it myself. It's all, it's in line to try to simplify the user interface because it's very complex and full. It's a very, very full thing. Yes. So I would 
I would really suggest that you take Shannon up on this offer because that's a fantastic offer. But then I would also try to get your supervisor involved with it. You know, we have the majority of our users are professionals, our supervisors who use skills in order to guide them for the next level. Absolutely. So give me a call. And she also wanted you to know uh, that you made her day today when you said that her son is in line that's, to be in the best possible case. Yeah. And she said, yay, tears of joys right now. Thank you so much. That oh, made for sure okay. just reading just hearing the things that you you know i it's know well. yes you have a very high functioning high potential child it's just a matter of doing the thing, right things. And uh, the person about the covering ears wrote in and said, thanks for taking my uh, question on the covering ears. He's reacting when he is aware of the sound. If he doesn't know the machine is on, he won't react, uh, but more knee-jerk reaction. She said, thank you, ladies, and I'll work harder on the BIP. I don't want you to work harder. I want you to play. I yeah. want you to go in and play with it. Yeah. No hard work. And test something out, by the way. How, separate the two topographies. So right now you've tested out that he won't react if the sound is there alone. You've tested that he reacts when the sound and the visual are there. Test out what he does if just the visual is there. So go there and pretend to turn on the toaster. Don't go through all the motions so it makes no sound. Mm -hmm. Then I want to see if he reacts. Okay. So then you'll know if, you know, what is it? He might react to that because uh, it is the visual. It's your the aspect of you doing it. And if not, then it's the combination that you need to deal with. Okay. And, and we'll hear back from you next week. And so Somebody else wrote in and said that smile.amazon.com for Act Today is now bookmarked as my go-to Amazon site. Thank you for answering oh, great. and sharing your experiences, always learning. All of you can do that. You know, when you go to smile.amazon.com, you have the opportunity to choose from a plethora of different 501c3 charities that you can give to. And one of them is Autism Care and Treatment Today. And when you, when you if you check that one off, every time you go to Amazon after that, a little prompt will come up and say, hey, you have the opportunity to go to the Smile site and anything you buy, a percentage of what you buy will go to Act Today. It doesn't cost you anything. It's an opportunity for you to put funding in families' hands to get iPads, to get fencing, to get everything, everything under the us. sun. Yeah. So many families who need this so desperately. Uh, you know, just uh, to mention a couple of things, our military families, our families from underserved populations, our families that are struggling with self-injurious behavior, families that need an iPad so their child can speak and be heard. Right. So, And Nancy will speak more of this, but she and I often uh, say we've basically tapped out all our friends nobody will see even talk to us anymore because like we really we really need help we have a lot of families asking for help and we can barely we can there's not we don't even come close to serving all their needs and amazon so, smile.amazon.com is a great way to do it it doesn't cost you anything and every time you buy something from amazon you'll tap into the the billions that are there for amazon to have them give to the charity that you choose we hope that you'll choose act today but uh it, it, pick something don't just buy something on amazon every again it's a great way to give